I think it is going to grow multifold. There's 10 stocks in Nexus at the moment and the list is building and, and there's something very exciting coming into the service later this month. When a technology seeps its way right down to your machine and, and you're using it in ways that's powerful for your life, you can only imagine what these mega businesses, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft and the likes are using it for, how they've developed it, what their plans are. We built a server farm. We're, we're building, yeah, five new kilometers of NVIDIA chips are installed in the my, in the my Wall Street AI Center every month. Hi there, and welcome to Stock Club a podcast brought to you by My Wall Street. I'm Mike, and joining me in today's episode is My Wall Street's chief investor Emmett Sevich. This podcast is brought to you by Vodafone Business. Now, if you're like us here in My Wall Street, you'll know that running a business is hard. There are countless things to think about. Some get ignored, and some get completely forgotten about. That's where Vodafone Business can help. They've crafted a suite of tools and supports to boost your business's operations, and the best part is it's free for everyone. From cybersecurity to harnessing the power of AI, building a website and improving how your teams operate remotely, Vodafone Business will help you address the often overlooked but crucial elements for your business's success. To get started today, check out their Vodafone vHub digital support and advice service. You'll find everything you need right there. Find the link in our show notes or just simply Google Vodafone vHub for more details. Now, let's dive into the show. Emmett, how are you? You missed uh, you missed last week's pod. We had a great chat with Derek Riley. How's all? I actually only listen to stock clubs that I don't appear yeah. in. I'm sure our listeners go and know why, but uh, I really enjoyed that podcast and and took a second look at Polestar after. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the Polestar conversation is a really interesting one. I think BYD is interesting. Yeah. There's so much that came out of it. Some of the uh, some of the pick and shovel plays as well. He's a really mm. smart fella. Yeah, he is. It's great. It's great to have that resource, I suppose, with this podcast too. Do you know what I mean? We've talked about electric vehicles from an investing perspective for, for from your perspective for 10 years at least, I think. How, how long have you owned Tesla? Um, I'd say about 12 or 14 years. I've owned it for a long yeah. time. And I've often said my greatest investment uh, decisions were mistakes and the mistake in this case was I forgot to sell my last bit of Tesla about eight years yeah. ago um, where I, I was looking at a new shiny thing so very uh, as we always say long-term buy and hold you just don't know which stocks are really going to prosper um, and if you buy right and sit tight I think that's the one that that uh, that's the strategy that works best in fact that reminds me many years ago about 10 years ago John Tyrrell and I were in uh, my co-founder and I were in California and we and John met or rather spoke to Charles Schwab the man the founder of what is probably now the biggest retail brokerage in the world and he said uh, women outperform men and the deceased outperform women because they just don't mess around with their folio. So as cohorts go, long-term buy and hold is the supreme strategy of somebody who's gone off to meet their maker and bringing it back to Tesla by be accidentally not selling. Now it is neck and neck as my biggest position alongside Netflix. Mm, but it, it's mad to think that you made that investment, what, 12, 13, 14 years ago, and we're still talking about Tesla and electric vehicles as if they're the next big thing. Do you know what I mean? We had a we had yeah. a conversation yeah. that very like out of the blue stock called Wooling, I think it is. Yeah. And it makes these yeah. little boxy, tiny smart cars. They're only for city driving, but it's the fastest growing car company in the world. And I see uh, that there's a Citroen version. I'm just repeating what we said last week, but there's yeah. a Citroen version flaking around France. You see them everywhere. And it, it just to me, that's very much the future of at least city driving. It's very clear that that yeah. makes so much sense for certain places, at least. Um, but you're on the money. You could talk about it forever, and it, it's always new. It's like is is a pharmaceutical a new industry? Well, it's not really. It's been around for scores of years. You know, hundreds of years. You could argue, but it is today is day one. It's day one in breakthrough medications. Every business's first day in existence. You could argue is right now because what you've learned and done is in the past, and really the future is the future. And it's a very relevant conversation. The whole electric vehicle conversation, and it will be relevant probably for the next 100 years until the next thing comes along. Mm, absolutely. Okay, well, let's get into today's show and we're doing something a bit differently. Um, so we launched a service called Nexus in about mid-November, was it? Yeah, November, November 15th. They should be aware of it. I hope they're aware of it. But if they're not, I just want to get through kind of what's the service, how how was it built, 
how's it doing so far? The, the performance, probably the most important thing. And like, we can get into the weeds of things. I think it would be really interesting for our listeners to maybe talk about the biggest winner so far. Um, I know it's a stock I never heard of, and I'd be very impressed unless you work in this business, if you've heard of it too. So, yeah. so let's, let's kick it off and just remind our listeners about Netflix, uh, Netflix, Nexus. <laughs> you ever heard of Netflix? Um, yeah, we should. Yeah, that name was gone. We went to call it Netflix and it was like, God, <laughs> oh, there's a business out there, a small little business. Yeah, actually, I agree. And I think that this episode might just carry the highest value of an episode we've ever done. Because as you said, let's have a chat about the biggest winner. And it's the biggest winner. I mean, the service is only uh, mid-November, December. It's only like two and a half months old. And, and while our big, the biggest winner is up something like 40 or 50%, I think it is going to grow multifold. So really, to our listeners, just hang on in there. Uh, and we're doing something quite different here today by unveiling that. Because we you, you build a service, you don't want to rob those who've subscribed of the value they've they've paid for there's 10 stocks in nexus at the moment and the list is building and, and there's something very exciting coming into the service later this month but i do think to our listeners just hang on in there and as you said even the people who work for this business probably have barely heard of it <laughs> it is a absolute it is like you know i i, I had to double check how it's, how it's spelled but let, let's get there so uh why did we launch it was that the question <laughs> yeah I, I suppose that that's the perfect place yeah. to start what what's the service and why do we launch it what was yeah. the motivations behind launching it but it, it's funny because during the week, uh, I, I spoke to a guy called Doug Clinton, who wrote a Substack article uh, on the 3rd of January, I think it was, called 2024, the year of AI-powered stock picking. And the piece basically said that very soon, a human plus an AI fund will win big versus the markets. And I mentioned that because here at my Wall Street, we've been aware of AI for a long time. I studied neural networks which is a subset of AI about 30 years ago in DCU uh, when I was doing my undergrad bachelor's. And, and since we launched my Wall Street 10 years ago, I have and, and the technical team have been, I suppose, tinkering with the technology in various ways on the belief and I suppose on, under the weight of the fact that someday computers would overthrow the pathetic earthlings to do what we do here even better. And we've discussed AI on, AI on Stock Club so many times. I mean, yourself and I think it was Anne-Marie had a brilliant conversation midway through last year when GPT was just coming up like a surge and, and aiding and overtaking everyone in a decision-making job or a thinking job. And, uh, and it's an easy argument to say that AI is moving across multiple industries yeah. and it's bolstering human output and decision making. Absolutely. And I think you know? the proliferation of access means a company the size of my Wall Street can access it too now compared to when it used to yeah. be for the top funds, like famously Renaissance Capital, uh, the Jim Simons Fund. That that they're, yeah. they're, They probably brought AI and machine learning in particular along so much, but they had rooms and full of computers like that you'd see in NASA, yeah. you know, back in the seventies and eighties right. that originally powered it. Yeah. And that's how far it's come in the space of, I suppose, 40 years. And that's a very good point. When a technology seeps its way right down to your machine and, and you're using it in ways that's powerful for your life, you can only imagine what these mega businesses, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, and the likes are using it for, how they've developed it, what their plans are. And unless you've worked in a giant company or at least had a tour of a giant company to get a feel for what does a, a trillion or multi-trillion dollar business look like it's actually quite hard to envisage that you know small businesses will get it might decide they're going to have one or two ai ai experts or maybe a medium-sized business if it's relevant might have a small team dedicated to the emerging tech but when you go into something like apple where they would employ thousands of people to collectively work on a, um, an AI sponsored objective, you just realize that this technology is absolutely mind bendingly big. Many years ago, I remember going out to uh, a suburb of Dublin called Clonshock, and there was a data center out there. And I'd never been in a data center. I, I was in the springtime of my career, I was probably only about, um, I'd say, my late 20s. And I remembered the door opened to the room where the server farm was going to be built. 
and it was empty. And I had never seen a, biz, a, a, a floor space so big, so white, so well lit and so empty. And at the very, very, very far end of, of the room, there was a ladder against the wall. And I said, geez, you could keep your ladder a bit closer than that. <laughs> airport hangar doesn't even begin yeah. and then when and eventually a couple of years later i saw this thing filled with racks and racks and racks and miles literally miles of servers if you walked up and down the aisles it's a boring walk uh, after a while but for the first while it's absolutely fascinating it's like you've walked into a matrix movie anyway i'm going yeah. on we built a server farm <laughs> with miles and miles <laughs> of servers underneath we're, we're Row. five kilometers of yeah, five new kilometers of of um, NVIDIA chips are installed in the in the My Wall Street AI Center uh, every month. But um, so Nexus is a human and AI powered service, and what differentiates it from anything we've done in the past is it's our first foray into artificial intelligence powered research on the simple fact that it is going to grow. And we've always said we're real human intelligence powered, we're RHI, and until computers overtake people, we're gonna remain RHI, and humans have a, have a strategic advantage over computers with temperament. Well, that is true if you have the right temperament, but a computer can be coded to have a better temperament, which circles back to the point that Schwab said, which is the best cohort of investors are deceased. and. Um, uh, and if you kind of, that's easy to codify, you know, like it's just long term buy and hold and it's that your thoughts don't interfere with you. So as our listeners know, the word nexus is used to describe the middle bit, the central or focal point. And in our products respect, if you think of a three circle Venn diagram back from your school days, three bubbles all intersecting, the center part is the nexus. And for us, the, uh, we, we chose the name because we were bringing together good old fashioned filtering. And one of the things anyone who's into this pursuit of stock investing eventually does is they filter. They're like, show me a business that has a market cap between 400 million and 2 billion. And then they might add another filter, only show me American listed businesses and so on. And that has been our bread and butter for 10 years. And we have built some really good, sophisticated filters, which bring trends into the equation. And I'll, I suppose I'll dive into that in a moment. So Bubble one in our next di next uh, in our Venn diagram is advanced filtering, and this is proprietary because we really do have a phenomenal set of filters that have managed to weed out some, uh, let's say, less favorable investments. And and when we back test it, which I'll talk about, it works very well. And and we're now applying it for Nexus to. 58, 59, actually maybe 60,000 companies around the world. There's roughly speaking about 6,000 businesses listed in the US, which is a Grand Central Station of great investments. But the other 90% is all over the world. And, and it's, it just stands to reason that every business should be considered and a good filter should take the bang up to uh, up to date data from every stock exchange in the world, which is what we've done 60, 61 exchanges. Um, so that's bubble one filtering. Bubble two is AI and AI, our application of it, it's changing so quickly. I mean, at first we had a widget built in GPT and then we start to use one of the uh, open AI APIs to build out, assist, to integrate into a system we already had an absolute mountain of data, like one mile's worth of data. How about that? Uh, <laughs> and, um, and then the third bubble is real human intelligence. The stuff we do here um, and our analyst team debating the output and and then a wider set of advisors and we're very lucky to have some of the greatest thinkers uh at the end of a phone wh whether it's some of the greatest economists in the world and some of the greatest stock pickers in the world and and those who subscribe know who those people are um chris mayer uh, picked a couple of stocks with us and and coincidentally when we had ran the first run of the nexus algorithm and it's bad out by 50 names uh four of the five names that that chris mayer spoke to us about were actually in that list of 50 which is great and i don't want to get caught up in confirmation bias but there's the three bubbles filtering AI and humans, and in the middle, we've built a service called Nexus, and um, and it's basically a new way for us to find and reach our, reach research stocks, and and that's why it was spun off as a separate service. It's 
entirely done differently. And the plan is to refine and train your AI. The word is you train an AI system and that delivers something that gets better and better and better. And it's already really good. It's actually very, very impressive already. Mm. Quick reminder, folks, from Vodafone Business, the sponsors of Stock Club, check out their free one-to-one digital support and advice service today to discuss a range of topics from social media tips, cybersecurity, even building a website. Search Vodafone VHub or click the link in the show notes for today's episode. So so how, how good? Let's talk through the service and the training, I suppose, that goes into it. Right. So as you, as you rightfully said, the service launched in mid-November uh, with an initial nine stocks that made the grade and there's 10 in there now. And and I suppose it's on me to at least just somewhat explain this Nexus score, which we, we, we spent about 24 months uh, developing and tweaking and refining and measuring. And, and the Nexus score um, is applied to the stock's before published and obviously it's a toll gate to get through and each of the 10 stocks uh gets the score it's a score of one to 100 and it's broken up of quantitative elements which have about a 30 percent weighting and the quantitative elements um there's i think there's seven of them so <laughs> working from memory here so we have return on equity from the last reporting period and the re- there's a there's a heavy reasoning beside these seven metrics so listen up folks because what i'm about to say has the weight of the greatest investors behind them so return on equity in the last reporting period the five-year trend on return on equity is also considered so that's a separate data point so not just the roe now but the roe's direction uh the five-year trended return on invested capital which we've discussed on the show here before which is like the cousin of return on equity but also takes money borrowed into account it basically roe return on equity and return on invested capital um are ways of expressing a numerical way of expressing how efficient mm. a business yeah. is using their capital put, or share put, it, put capital. a euro in get 120 back is the kind of goal yeah exactly that's it. It, it, it the perfect slot machine you put a as you say a dollar a euro in the top and a dollar 20 a book 20 euro 20 falls at the bottom you just keep going um the fourth metric is a multi uh period revenue growth rate so we don't want to just see um good revenues we want to see a trend mm. uh, and that's something we'll talk more about and it's funny when you look at growing businesses there's this like uh for those who are the business that have grown revenue year on year on year quarter and quarter you can very much tell where that horrible chapter in humanity occurred where sales fell off a cliff in the year 2020 where everybody ran home and stayed at home and certain businesses either had a jump in revenue and others had an aberration in re- re- revenue but generally to find a smooth growth revenue business with 10 years in in mind is is a little trickier than it would have been in the past but that's another so that's number four number five is insider ownership has been measured over and over again there's so many white papers uh, between five and forty percent is the optimum range because the founders and senior managers and people on the floor of a business are aligned with shareholders and it's in their interest to grow the business's share price uh, so decisions will be ultimately focused on creating that value then the sixth uh, uh, metric that we ran through ne- nexus or that is currently coded in in is insider trading activity so a buy is more meaningful than a sell but we want to see insiders uh buying uh, ideally and then uh the seventh one that we went with was uh price to earnings growth which is also known as the peg ratio and peg ratio first came to my attention when i read one up on wall street on my honeymoon 22 oh. years ago or 20 years ago whoops uh oh, my my beautiful wife is this 20 years ago so peg ratio something that that um peter lynch has uh has espoused as as a, is a, is a business that fundamentally is undervalued so there are the seven numbers numbers are fine because you can get them with a filter you can now it's a little harder with trend lines trend lines are not captured with a filter which is where ai, AI comes in I, I would tell you it's i someone said to me something which i thought was quite interesting which is filters give you a snapshot of the state of affairs right now today just in all the businesses in the world if you said show me the ones that are profitable you can reduce the let's just say seventy thousand, sixty thousand listed businesses down to i don't know 30,000. And that's right now today. But trend lines are actually more meaningful. And that's where AI comes in, what is in our application of it anyway, where you can actually just say, don't tell me about a highly profitable business. Show me the businesses that have had revenue growing and have 
uh, well, we won't go into the weeds, but we basically have uh, ways of extrapolating the numbers, um, and that's something we're refining at the minute. So that's the quantitative elements, the, the stuff you can put on a weighing scales and do with numbers. Then we have the qualitative elements, which actually gets a 70% rating because numbers tell a very important story. And you can very quickly shortlist some great businesses with numbers, but you really do have to dive in then. And the qualitative elements are more drawing on the right side of the brain, to quote a book. Um, and stuff uh, like barriers to entry, moats, the management team, culture in the business, things that are a little bit harder to measure. And generally, everything can be brought down to a numerical score. You can tell, you can see Glassdoor has numbers for what's it like to work in a business, but um, qualitative and quantitative numbers combine together to score mm. every business. Absolutely. And that's like the perfect example of that is the most recent stock you added to Nexus, which on a quantitative basis wouldn't rank uh, wouldn't rank that highly, no. especially compared to the other names in the list. But because of these you other bet. factors and because of a certain management team and and, and the yeah. very specific kind of uh, characteristics of this business, it was like, well, it's going in anyways. That's right. And in fact, it was Chris Mayer who called us about, uh, spoke to us about that. And and I think we, we put the recording on the service of that conversation with Chris, where he flew in and met the management team and he explained what it is he saw and heard. And that's that wasn't captured in the Nexus score. So you really have to... Uh, take a number for what it's worth and know that noth nothing at the moment is so reductive um, to a number. But we did backtest Nexus. This was something we spent ages doing. And and what, as we say in our, in our, in our literature about it, um, it would have pinpointed stocks such as Monster, Sleep Number, and Biospecifics ahead of their remarkable growth of 237-fold, 177-fold, and 97 fold respectively but that is a fact that isn't just marketing bum for me look at the when we we back tested the the entire nexus way across 20 years of data those stocks were isolated however with all of that said mike we had a very important learning um with the first product of my wall street launched 10 years ago so the business will be 10 years old this october and we keep a close eye on what we did in the past to measure what we're doing now and what did we learn? What did we get right? What did we get wrong? And there's a long list on both sides of the balance sheet. But um, when we launched our first app and ranked 36 stocks, we ranked them, literally stack ranked them. People only wanted to buy the first five or 10. I mean, if you, you look at the premiership, you look at the, uh, the, the British Soccer League, the premiership, and you just, you know, everything is stack ranked. Our brains like to see who's in first, second, third, fourth, fifth place. And if you're going down to Aston Villa, you're not going to back that horse. You're going to go up to the top of the league. So people naturally just say, well, just tell me what's the best. And that in the world of investing is a very big flaw because we learned that Tesla, Apple, and Microsoft, for example, were in our first list, our first list of 36 stocks but they were not in the top five. Um, they were shortlisted from thousands of companies because they were not uh, in the top spot. They were overlooked. People, uh, we could we could see on big data what people uh, were were gravitating towards, and um, and because Tesla was kind of ranked fifteen, barely got any attention ten years ago. When in fact, with the passage of time, whether you like Musk or the business or its prospects today, it's been an absolutely phenomenal investment. NVIDIA was ranked 22 in our first list. Um, so a single number score of one to hundred is, is flawed and it's in fact dangerous because it gets, because those with the lowest score might in fact grow 100 fold. And it's that intricacy, I suppose, um, uh, that uh, that you have to be cognizant of as an investor that just bringing something down to a score isn't good enough you need to actually uh spread your wings wider than that mm, absolutely and look i know it's very early days i think it's only been in operation about 10 weeks but let's go yeah, through yeah. the performance so far just you know we're not taking any early victory laps or anything but it is no it is no certainly it. not yeah the true for sure I, well at the end of last week mike the average return of the first nine stocks, the 10th the was only published maybe last week, I don't know, maybe the week before. So excluding that, but the first nine stock, the average return in those two months from the 15th of November to the 15th 
of January plus a week, shall we say, was 11.2%. And the return of the S&P 500 in the same period, which was 4.8%, which means that this collective of nine stocks 2 x the market. But in fairness, as I said, in such time frame, doing or as you said a victory lap it, it's just crackers to, to to do it but hey look i'd rather it was up than down yeah, um and are, are being we you probably, know if you're gonna we choose probably would have cut the section out if it was down 11.2 percent. you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah but you know i i have an absolutely warped uh psychology for investing because when i buy a great business and it falls i've almost spent years inverting my my emotion to it's like oh great i can get more but let's not go there that's another podcast we scribble that down in our book of ideas but um so seven of the nine are up and very well up they're really well up and our biggest winner which we're going to get onto, is only up about 40 percent. and i say only up because really i think the room to run is huge huge um and i i would say that whether it was even if it was down 40 percent um and 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 the biggest loser so let's that we'll get onto that but the biggest loser of the first nine is down about 7.4 percent but back to my point about my inverted i suppose psyche i am basically going to plow into this stock in the next buy alert and horizon yeah. like uh, that's another story that's another service that's another story but i am going to jump on it because this business the one we're not going to discuss the one i'm next going to buy in horizon it's the next walmart may as well just put it there but anyway i'm another another podcast okay. idea so yeah, so there okay. you go. Well, I think one of the big features and probably one we haven't discussed enough yet is the fact that Nexus is predominantly international stocks. Um, mm. That's because we yeah, were able right. to cast a wider net with the research process and we were able to go through basically almost all of the exchanges in the world, yeah. pretty much more or less. So That's right. So for our listeners, mm. benefit, just tell us what regions Nexus considers. Yeah, getting this data is actually quite expensive. <laughs> it's tricky. Like if you go to FactSet, who are um, the de facto provider, one of the kind of, there's probably four or five providers. Um, actually, I won't bore our listeners, listeners with that, but sure, look, we, we get the data. It covers 63 exchanges. I have the list here in front of me. It has... Um, Let's see, any interest, Sao Paulo, the Sao Paulo Stock Exchange, um, Stock, I'm coping in this thing, Riga, Vilnius, Tallinn, the Indonesia Stock Exchange, the Bursa, Malaysia, um, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, the Oslo Stock Exchange. The reality is a lot of these stock exchanges did not bear any fruit. There wasn't a whole lot of interesting stuff. We do like have, we have the data from the Botswana Stock Exchange and, and the Lima Stock Exchange, but as you suspect, the next, well, the next big thing it doesn't appear to be hidden in there, but I wouldn't be so uh, smug as to say they're not. But I, I, I wouldn't jump on the Colombian Securities Exchange to try and find the next CRISPR therapeutics. You know, um, the bees to honey generally end up in America. And of course, we considered uh, the big US exchanges and UK based exchanges. So New York Stock Exchange, London Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, of course. So it's everything. We take every business into the system. We squash it through some NVIDIA chips and it reduces it down to a list yeah and there's obviously a bit of common sense there you know this is where the human intelligence comes into play too there could be a company you know a micro cap on the where with buenos aires stock exchange that has unbelievable yeah. numbers but yeah. it's not really a stock you can recommend considering the amount of volatility in argentina and the currency totally. is yeah. so, so there has to be kind of uh, that filtering process beyond the numbers. That's right. And it's actually right back to our point, the real human intelligence thing. And even you saying that, that of course can be captured as in other words, just don't show me these emerging markets or hyperinflative markets. But you're right, there is a common sense thing that you have to superimpose at the end. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to get into, um, we're going to get into the, the Nexus's best performer, but I just want you to set up a bit of a, a bit of a teaser, I suppose, by describing the business. I, I don't know if it's going to help yeah. because I don't think people have heard of it either way, but it could be nah. a good exercise. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So everybody I want you to listen up and, and try and uh, shout the name out as you drive your car. Um, look, before I do that, I, I do want to say, Mike, that the next big winner is out there and our job, my Wall Street's job is to find it. 
Um, and there are 10, I think, outstanding contenders in Nexus. And I, if someone, if, if my broker rang me and said, I sold your, your folio and accidentally bought these 10 stocks and you can't buy them, you can't sell them, I mean, until you're 77, I'd be fine, whatever, that's fine. I'm delighted with that. Um, but there's 10 outstanding stocks in Nexus. Uh, so um, you and I are picking, so you and I picking one is fun. Um, but there are loads more in the service. Uh, and in fact, later, by the way, later this month, we, you and I well know because we proofread it. Next, publishing a list of nine small and micro cap stocks that are all profitable. They're all listed in the United States. They're all growing. And more importantly, they've been isolated by by our algorithm. So uh, now would be a good time to subscribe, folks. Um, yeah. So uh, we might I'll just, just make sure to put a link in the show notes for this episode as well, guys. Yeah, exactly. But listen, it's not cheap, but quality is never cheap. And it is something different. And I think it will produce outsized returns. Uh, I'll go ahead with that teaser. Um, the le- oh, Here we go. The leading cause of death for US citizens under 50 is not heart disease, suicide or road accidents. It's from opioid overdose. And this epidemic, Mike, was responsible for 107,000 deaths in 2022, which has led to the lowest life expectancy in America in 25 years. Isn't that mind blowing? Yeah, it really is. That this Shocking. plague has hit. Oh, it's heartbreaking. When Bill and Bill Mann and Chris uh, Hill were over there in over here in November, we were talking about it. It's just heartbreaking to think that this has uh, disrupted small town America. It's really something else. But anyway, to the business, this company is a leader in long acting opioid dependence treatment in Europe and in Australia. It's it is one of the names that's out there, and the FDA approved its treatment because it is superior and it is now available to us patients uh, with opioid use disorder since a couple of days before um, Nexus went live. So just, I think it was actually just a matter of weeks before Nexus was published. This business was approved by the FDA for their solution to that plague on humankind. So folks, what is it? Name that <laughs> <Yeah>. business. <laughs> I think I think our listeners will be forgiven for not knowing the uh, opioid treatment drugs. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Well, anyway, look, uh, I can hear crickets coming back from our listenership. So it's everybody's Swedish pharma and biotech firm specializing in commercializing drugs for serious and chronic conditions, with its main product being a long acting buprofenine injection for open opioid addiction. It's Camurus, C-A-M-U-R-U-S, Camurus AB, to be uh, formal about it. And and um, it's currently, I have Yahoo Finance open here in front of me. It's it's currently 525 Swedish kroner per share, which I think is about 52. It's about 10 to 1. It's 11 about 11 to 1. To one yeah, is that so right? 11 to 1. So we're talking books. about, four, yeah, under 50 bucks. Uh, per share if you're going to buy it. Its market cap is 31 uh, billion uh, kroner, which we let's for easiness sake divide it by 10. So it's a $3 billion business that's just been on a tear. It's profitable um, and it's hidden. And um, it, its development pipeline is targeting all types of addiction and pain and cancer and endocrine disorders uh, through their in-house development and global partnerships. But this is one of the uh, Davids versus Goliaths mm. in the pharma world because they are they are doing something really special and, and their treatment works because we spent a lot of time, uh, coming back to the human element of Nexus, actually getting reading what our patients saying about it and and there's a long long list of people who are saying they were on the brink of something awful and are back now off and they've beaten the, the they've beaten the, the condition yeah and I, and I think if you're looking at was the top the top killer of people under 50 in the us and a three billion company that's out to that's out to fight it it, it shows the size of the opportunity there obviously there's a lot of competition but but it, re- it really yeah. is an exciting business and and it's a business yeah. that wouldn't come across your desk normally either not a chance no. <laughs> like this is a real this is a real black swan i mean i don't want to say hey buy it forget about it it's definitely going to be a winner but certainly i think it is yeah <laughs> yeah okay so one of the features we have with nexus is it plots the stocks on a risk probability scale which you you can you're better at describing the graphs emmett um so yeah like, 
Oh, yeah, our, our customers love that. Our <laughs> listeners love that. Mike, you have a go, because I'll do one in a minute. Actually, I'm going to open up cameras now, but you, you describe basically, it. Basically, you, you it's do an X, Y axis on yeah. <laughs> yeah. the level of risk <laughs> and the level of return expected. Pro- it, no, no, it's the probability of of making money over five years is on the bottom bottom line. The one goes out to the one that goes out to the right. Yeah. So, so the, the, the kind of, I, I suppose it's a risk reward scale. Would that be? Uh, a, a simplification of it and camera scored highest on potential for returns with a decent probability of it too so so we're talking about the kind of very very high potential stock and that's because of everything you just said because of its size because of its market opportunity and for investors as well because it's so unheard of i guess is it's that also is a big a big factor in the opportunity there too isn't it it is and while our listeners are are daydreaming about graphs as we describe them and listening to our dulcet tones kind of god i love this bit like the revenue the revenue of cameras is just unreal um it has grown at a compounded annual growth rate in the last five six years of 108 percent. so in uh, by the end of 2018 the revenue is about 50 million and then the year by December 2019, it had doubled to about 105, 110 million. And then the year later, December 2020, it tripled to 336 million. Then the end of the next year, it had doubled again to 600 and something million. Then the end of the next year, which was December 2022, it had uh, grown up to about a billion. And then in the trailing 12 months, and we need to get the final figure for December 2023, it's grown again to about 1.6 billion. So if you're looking at a graph, this is like, it is actually exponentially shaped. It's just up it goes. Um, and that's, that. Our, I know our customers are, sorry, I keep saying, I know our listeners are loving this. So I'm just going to give you another one. Speaking of Nexus identifying trends, but return on equity just for example, is up, 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 where a few years ago was neg minus 22%. Then uh, that was in the year 2020, it was minus 22%. Then it went to minus 10%. Then it went to 6% in December 2022. And right now it's about 40%. Now, if we were to just uh, bring Chris Mayer back onto our podcast, he'd say, I the one number I most value is return on equity and specifically growth in return in equity and anything above 20% is elite. And we're now talking about a business, a Swedish business doing something very important that has grown its revenue. Yeah, let's just say more or less doubled it every year for the last five years. And its return on equity is 40%. So you put that dollar in the slot machine and that book 40 falls out the bottom he stick the dollar 40 up the top and then at the bottom it drops 184 uh, so like and so it continues no i got that all wrong so we, uh, we'll get that we need ai we, to correct we, we get the machine to do our math and what's interesting as well yeah. is that that revenue growth came from before the fda approved its uh, opioid treatment mm. in america so that only came in september of 2023 mm. So you think of the opportunity I, ahead I, of there. I'm blown away at how big a problem this is. So I don't, I don't dare, and I don't wish to ever say an opportunity because that is, an opportunity is celebratory, and this is not shouldn't be framed in that this is a big problem and they're out to cure that problem i know one of our listeners lost their stepson to this very problem i was speaking to him recently heartbreaking story a young man who didn't deserve what he got and made one mistake and that's it paid the ultimate price and i i I can't believe i know people who have lost someone from this problem Uh, i know a couple of people so it's just it has to be stopped it has to be cured and and cameras are on the front foot for addressing that absolutely okay well that's cameras. That's Nexus. Um, Sign up in the show notes, folks. You won't regret it. In terms of condition, yeah, pretty much. That is, and <laughs> we were talking about it. But that—that's why someone would sh- sign up. And there's think of that's one stock uh, at a very quick mm. pitch. There's so much more details mm. within the actual write-ups and more information and graphs and all the rest. And think of nine more. And how many more to come over the course of 2024, Emmett? Is it next six or seven? Yeah, that's right. Loads. Yeah, I, yeah we'll see what happens. We don't. We aren't adhering to this uh, uh, publishing schedule because we don't. We just want to make sure that everything has been fully checked. I think the uh, the report that's going out in the next week or two with the nine smaller microcaps is very, very compelling. And the one that's coming down the tracks after that, which I'm trying to speak to 
either CFO or CEO of the business before we give it the final go ahead. It's just unbelievable. So it really is, I think it's a great service and now I've gone into pitching mode, but honestly, uh, I, I do think that the 10 stocks in there, there's going to be a face melter in there to use the term of Jack Black. That's great. Okay, um, that's it for the pod, lads. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you're intrigued by Nexus and we'll check it out. Obviously, it is an expensive product made for serious investors, but if you think that's you, I would highly recommend getting involved. Um, before we finish up, I just want to thank our friends at Vodafone Business. If you're a business owner in need of a leg up when it comes to your digital transformation get yourself over to Vodafone VHub to book your appointment today you can just google Vodafone VHub or find the link in our show notes uh, remember if you have any questions you like answered or elevator pitches you'd like us to tackle make sure to get in touch you can find us on Twitter at my Wall Street, on TikTok at my Wall Street, or simply just email us at pod at mywallstreet.com if you're enjoying the show leave us a review send us on to your friends and uh, we will talk to you next week <laughs>